Hello, and thank you for joining us for the inaugural Zscaler APAC Virtual CXO Summit, reducing, reducing the risk and complexity of secure cloud deployment. If you have any questions throughout today, please let us know. Uh, for any technical questions, reach out to cxosummit at zscaler.com. This is a public session and the opinions expressed in this discussion by third parties are solely those of the guest and not necessarily those of Zscaler. Zscaler does not guarantee the accuracy or reliability of the information disclosed during the discussion. We will be sharing the recording after. Please share and follow using the hashtag ZscalerCXOSummit. We are very excited to have you be a part of today's conversation. There are a few ways for you to participate. So please participate by submitting your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and responding to polling questions throughout the session. You will now see your first live session, live poll now. Now it is my great pleasure to introduce to you and welcome SVP of Cloud Protection, Rich Campagna. Thank you, Julia, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the inaugural Zscaler APAC Virtual CXO Summit, the new enterprise CXO priorities, protect valuable data, optimize performance, and per, per, excuse me, preserve the environment. Uh, today's session, I think, is a fantastic topic. We're going to be talking about public cloud security. Uh, to the session title, Reducing the Risk and Complexity of a Secure Cloud Deployment. This is a massively important topic for pretty much every organization in every industry across the planet, right? Public cloud services spend is expected to reach over $330 billion next year. And those uh, that spend needs to be protected, uh, uh, absolutely. So we have a couple different segments in today's session. We're gonna hear from Zscaler's VP of Product Management, Moinul Khan. He's going to deconstruct a real world breach, an actual breach that has happened uh, describing its genesis, development, impact, and then he's going to provide guidance on best practice, prevention, and response. Uh, he's also going to be introducing the Zscaler Cloud Protection Suite. Uh, he's going to demonstrate its ability to simplify and automate risk reduction in public cloud environments. We're going to see that demo uh, at the tail end of the session here. But first, let's kick off our CXO Perspectives panel. I'm honored to have three esteemed guests here, Doug Hammond, the CISO for Uniting, Makesh Sandra Mohan, Group CISO at Aditya Birla Capital, and John Rolf, Rolf, excuse me, the General Manager for Cyber Risk and Resilience at Ventia. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know I'm looking forward to hearing your opinions on the, on the panel discussion, as I'm sure the audience is, is as well. Um, so with that, let's, uh, let's just jump right in. Uh, you know, I want to start by talking about uh, the cloud journey a little bit uh, that that you folks have have experienced, uh, and in particular, you know what what I observe uh, in in uh, speaking with organizations is that you know these days, you know, a couple of years ago, the question was, are these organizations, are various organizations going to go cloud or not? Uh, and now it seems that you know we're we're pretty much at the point where most organizations have at least some cloud presence, uh, and oftentimes the starting point is what's known as a lift and shift strategy. Right, you pick a, a single cloud provider, or maybe move a couple of workloads into uh, into one of these these cloud environments. It's a relatively simple uh, change, and and not too unlike um, you know one of your traditional data centers. But then over time, uh, what a lot of organizations are starting to go through, and sort of that in terms of that next phase of the journey, uh, is that they're introducing first of all a multi cloud strategy, which expands kind of the purview of of your cloud footprint. Uh, and they begin to refactor their applications or rebuild applications to use more cloud native services. And I think, you know, this is where I think a lot of the folks, um, you know, that are tuned to the webinar are, um, are in their journey right now is they're starting to make that shift to the, to the second phase. So I'd love to hear, you know, from the, you, the three of you folks, you know, uh, you know was that a, a part of your, your journey? And, and what security challenges has that second phase introduced for you as an organization? Um, and I don't know, maybe I'll roll my dice here to, to see who, who, who can kick this one off. Doug, maybe I'll go with you. Um, your thoughts here? Yeah, oh, thank you so much, Rich. Yeah, so um, the, the current organization that, that, that I'm working for, Uniting, um, is, is fortunate to still only be in Azure, so, so we don't have a multi-cloud um, presence, but um, my, my previous organization had um, cloud workloads in, in, in multiple clouds. 
And um, the, the security challenge was simply put was that each um, cloud has a different set of tools that, that, that come standard. There's different ways of configuring them. There's, there's interoperability challenges. There's um, authentication challenges and, and handoff between them. Um, it, it, it just, it just raises a huge level of complexity in, in terms of making sure that the standards that you've got are applied across the, the, the different cloud infrastructures and, and the on-prem. Yeah, and I, I would say that even, you know, even uh, specific to Azure, you know, at last count, uh, last time I checked, Microsoft has more than 600 uh, separate and distinct services uh, listed for, for Azure, right? And I think, you know, what a lot of um, organizations tend to tend to run into is that when those new services come out or when they change, what happens pretty much at any point in time, uh, you know, developers and your application teams want to jump on and use those services. So I'd say even even if you're just in a single cloud provider, you know some of the challenges you just described can be a can be a very big thing, um, you know, to kind of wrap your head around. Yeah, correct. And and getting the the the, the skills um, in house is is almost impossible. Yeah, we're going to talk about skills here in a second. But at first, let's let's hear a little bit from uh, maybe Mukesh. How about you? Your thoughts here? Hi, Rich. Uh, uh, thanks. Um... I, I completely agree. I think the second phase has put a lot of challenges in terms of um, um, having visibility. That's that's the first challenge for me when uh, uh, people are considering multi-cloud uh, and uh, multi-service provider when it comes to the cloud journey. Uh, quite it's exciting, but at the same time, I think it opens a, a little different uh, set of Pandora box of uh, the open risk for an organization. Especially when it comes to multi-cloud, I think the visibility to a, a CISO or a CISO organization is, is the biggest challenge I would consider. The second is uh, uh, obviously the roles and responsibilities and clarity around that is also a big challenge I would say, because uh, the, uh, the on-prem uh, existing team considers a lot of things as part of the service providers responsibilities. And the service providers uh, are clearly demarcating that uh, what is their responsibility and what will be the client's responsibility when they onboard their journey on the cloud, especially on the public clouds like Amazon or Microsoft. These are the two big challenges I would say. I think, uh, as you rightly said, the third one is also like about the skill sets, but which we will talk about a little later. Gotcha, excellent. So John, both of these these guys, uh, you know, they kind of mentioned this sort of you know seemingly complex you know set of services across multiple cloud providers. You know, what do you do uh, when you know a developer, or an application team, or whoever, whichever stakeholder inside of your organization comes to your team and says, "Hey, you know, there's this brand new service that we want to spin up," or you know, we have, uh, you know, we've we've standardized on this cloud, but we see these services in these other clouds. You know, how do you how do you deal with that? I mean, that that seems like a lot can be coming from a lot of different areas. What's what's sort of the process you might follow there? Yeah, so um, Ventia is a relatively young organization, which was only formed in about 2015. And we were spun out of uh, uh, another uh, number of companies. So we actually took a, a cloud first uh, strategy uh, because that was the easiest and quickest way to actually spin up a, uh, an organization of, of our size. But that that came with its own own difficulties with uh, the ease of the business actually spinning up software as a service. Um, and not necessarily coming you know, through the correct channels. So, so when I actually joined the, the organization, it was um, uh, really getting visibility of what services were, were in, in use, uh, which services that had been you know, formally uh, assessed and, and which hadn't, and um, using you know, technologies such as Zscaler to actually see the cloud services in use and then being able to put uh, controls around them uh, was, a, was a great help. Um, but, uh, and then as we've matured, we've moved into a proper you know, third party risk management uh, uh, mechanism so that um, uh, the business can now actually come to us and actually uh, um, you know, ask us, you know, uh, we wanna use this service, uh, you know, what, are, what are the risks? And, and we can then formally assess that and do our due diligence to actually uh, ensure that, that the service is, is secure, meets, you know, current, uh, meets our security standards and more importantly meets our our client requirements of uh, where data is actually processed. 
Um, that's one of the, the issues really in, in Australia is the, the number of, uh, or the limited number of, of sort of software as a service that are, that are hosting uh, locally. And um, that's uh, a big issue for, for our clients. Gotcha. And so for new services, then you have kind of a, a formal approval process that those services go through that your team kind of checks off. Yeah, so we, we've now implemented a, a formal uh, vendor risk assessment where we're, we're actually uh, assessing the, the supply using a Cloud Security Alliance uh, uh, questionnaire to actually determine the, the security of, of that, uh, uh, that solution. And, and like I said, more importantly, where is the data uh, actually hosted? Where is the, the, the uh, uh, solution you know, supported? And, and are there you know, mechanisms in place to actually protect a, you know, our, our client data. Gotcha, gotcha. So often, I mean, oftentimes these cloud vendors are innovating very rapidly, right? In fact, there was a, um, an announcement from Microsoft, I forget, maybe two, three months ago, where on a single day, they introduced 250 new features, um, you know, to various different services across, across Azure. Um, you know, do you, how, how does that work with this approval process? And how do you possibly manage to stay on top of this rapidly shifting uh, attack surface. Yeah, my, my, Microsoft is a real challenge because they uh, they introduce new new functionality to something like Office 365 and it's on by default and they, they know that they do it. So that, uh, because otherwise if it, if it had to come to guys like us, we, we would take a more cautious approach and we would uh, you know potentially slow down the, the adoption of the of the users. So it is a real challenge to uh, uh, to keep on top of the, the changes. And um, as we uh, acquire uh, different organizations, we've now uh, moved into a, a multi-cloud strategy. And um, uh, I have a small team because we're, we're such a low margin business. So um, it's really making use of um, yeah, security consultancies to do uh, you know, periodic risk, risk assessment on top of the, uh, the sort of security governance that I've, that I've put in place in, internally. Um, and, and being open to the to the business, so being uh, accessible, so the business can actually uh, uh, you know come to us uh, to say we want to use this this SaaS service rather than uh, uh, you know uh, get yeah try and try not to get get in the in the way so much. Gotcha. How about you, maybe you, Doug? Uh, I mean, do you have a, a sort of an approval process similar to what John described for new services or? You know, what happens when the business comes to you and say, hey, we want to use this new service that was just just released to market? Uh, you know, what's your response typically? Yeah, so so we, we have a formal governance process um, and, uh, you, you know, that uh, all, all new proposals that we're aware of go through. And, and to, to John's point, there's, there, there is stuff that, that happens that, that never comes through the approval process. And, and, and that's, that, that's one of the, the issues with, with, with cloud services is it's very easy for the business to just procure that, you know, kind of quietly in the background without uh, security or, or technology being, being involved. But for the things that, 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 that we are aware of, um, we we follow a, a formal approval process, and and looking at the security associated with that is is part of that. But but for a lot of these, it's um, you know it it comes with with the services and controls that that it comes with, and you have very little ability to to influence or, or modify that. You know, it is literally as a service, and you, and you 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 get what um what, what everybody else gets, and there isn't a lot of opportunity to to influence that. Gotcha. So as, as more and more of these services have made their way into your organization, how have you evolved um, the, the team, right? Has, has, has it been that you've added, you know, a lot of net new resources, people on, you know, that are, that are cloud native, have you grown more, uh, you know, some of these capabilities inside of the team? Yeah, and, and yeah, so absolutely um, not. <laughs> we simply don't have um, the, the the scale to to bring on um, you know specific people with with specific skills. So we we procure those as a service as well. So so we have a number of of, of third parties that that provide you know the the twenty four seven security operations type coverage that manage the SOC and the SIEM and and um, and and we, we look to partners that that have the skills that we need to to support us um, because again with the cloud particularly and I suppose it's true of, of most services these days because they're on twenty four seven and they can be attacked twenty four seven you need to have a twenty four seven 
team that's available and and to have that in-house is just simply unaffordable okay how about um for for you makesh has as developing or acquiring the right the right talent to take on some of this new you know cloud um you know cloud uh, um security area has that been a challenge for you and and anything unique or novel about how you've approached solving the challenge have you outsourced like uh like like Doug, or are you managing this in-house? Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, we also have the challenge, but we address this in a uh, two-pronged approach. Uh, one is uh, definitely, I think we have outsourced to some part of uh, uh, the servicing, the uh, operations to an outsourced partner who has better skills and better management capabilities, better understanding about the cloud, and uh, having an appetite to uh, continuously put learning curve over there. But parallelly, we also uh, work out a strategy where we continue to upskill our existing employees and on-prem team uh, who can manage partially some of those operations and shadow the outsourced partner. Because going forward in a long term, I don't think we can continue with an outsourced partner as a strategy. So we want to in-house it. Uh, so the upskilling is one of uh, uh, the strategy which we adopt for last one and a half to two years. I think every month uh, uh, there was a separate training uh, which was organized for on-prem uh, teams as well, so that they are not completely out of the curve. Uh, while we continue to uh, outsource to some of the key operations to the expertise. Gotcha. And that training is that something you've developed internally? Do you, you know, you look to third-party resources for the thing, maybe the cloud vendors so, or? Uh, so predominantly, we use uh, uh, two different approaches. One is like the native training. Uh, which uh, 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 we get it from the native OEM itself. For example, uh, uh, related technologies and the securities which are available on Amazon, we get it from AWS and AWS partners. Similarly for Azure, we do it with Azure and for Google, we do it with Google. That's one aspect. Second is like, we also have an expert, uh, an outsourced partner who provides generic fundamentals about the cloud security and cloud onboarding based on the new technologies and new threat and attack surface, which is getting subvencing. So that's something which we do it as a second. Third is about uh, a key security operational training, which uh, we used to get it from our security partner as part of our soft engagement. Gotcha. So as you invest in, and in, in, um, this is something I've heard from a number of other organizations many times in the past is that you know, invest in, in some of these uh, skills development for some of these folks, and then they become very attractive on the, on the open market. Is that an issue that you've had to, had to deal with? Yeah, sometimes it happens, but I, I, I don't think we have a choice right now, right? In, in the market also, I think you don't have good skilled people on this technologies because it's keep on evolving and the learning uh, capability of the individuals uh, matters a lot, right? It, it differs. If you go and ask for a cloud security engineer in the market today with six years experience, you don't get it in a market. It's, it's a new age and uh, it is very difficult. So the only option which was left out for an organization is to continue to upskill for the resources uh, who are already uh, with you and who are partially managing the infrastructure. The advantage of this is like you get, uh, you get complete know-how about uh, the ecosystem, the person who is managing both on-prem and the cloud, who has knowledge of both uh, so that uh, he can get a holistic picture and actually submit the proposal to the management in case if something has to happen. So that advantage is there. Uh, and uh, yes, of course, I think uh, the talent crunch and uh, the skill shortage is always a big uh, challenge for us. Yeah, as, as I think it is for organizations everywhere. I mean, we've had this, this skill shortage in uh, information security for quite some time, it seems, even kind of predating the, uh, the rise of cloud over the last uh, five or 10 years. So. Um, so I wanna, I wanna kind of you know, shift gears a little bit and, and talk about some of the culture and process change that comes about as the result of, of moving to the cloud, right? So as I, what I'm seeing and, and hearing from organizations is that you know, as they kind of evolve through this cloud journey, um, it's, it's not only kind of where they're hosting um, you know, their, their applications and services, but also the way they go about uh, developing applications and you 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 see a, this this gradual move towards more kind of oriented processes which you know I think have you know some fantastic benefits for you know the agility and innovation in the business uh, but can also mean quite a bit of disruption from a security standpoint so 
you know, maybe, maybe John, have, have, have you seen, you know, some of this, uh, some of this change uh, firsthand and, you know, what does it mean for, um, you know, adapting the way an InfoStack team kind of works when you, when you start to see this, this change in process in the development side? Yeah, so conceptually, it's, it's quite a change when uh, you don't have that, that, that perimeter uh, any longer. Um, and uh, the complexity, especially when you've got, when you've got multi-cloud as, as well. Um, so from a security perspective, it, it's really having, having your uh, detailed information security you know, framework uh, that sets out the, um, um, all the requirements for, for security so that, uh, and then making sure that um, developers and, and architects are, are well aware of, of the, you know, the standards and, um, uh, that are are expected. Um, separation of duties is also pretty important as well because it's um, so easy for, for someone to spin up a service uh, and uh, if they've got the right permissions to to make uh, start making network you know, rule changes in your in your cloud environment. So uh, ensuring that you you've still got that separation of, of duties so that there's there's still the governance and the change control. Um, yeah, as they move from from development into into production, um, and then also using uh, cloud-based security uh, products to actually um, do continual vulnerability assessment of of the solutions, monitoring changes in in your environment to you know, to make sure that the, uh, they're all a, all approved and not actually changing your your security risk uh, beyond you know what your uh, uh, your acceptable level. Gotcha. I hear often um, about uh, you know this this term shifting security left. Um, very big thing, right? Makesh, you know, is uh, you know tell tell us about that terminology and what it's meant for your organization. So uh, I think I think these changes are inevitable, right? So while we moved to a public cloud adoption, I think people started thinking about uh, moving from agile methodology to DevOps, right? That's uh, one of the prominent way to increase uh, the productivity, speed, and get to market very fast. And the, the moment people started talking about uh, DevOps, I think uh, we immediately jumped in and we said that, why don't you make it as DevSecOps, right? make security as part of the overall operations and ensure that there is no delay in the last minute or surprise in the last minute so that which might derail or delay the project. So that's something which uh, uh, we have uh, envisaged a little early and we had to define a framework for DevSecOps in our environment the moment people started looking at public cloud adoption. And uh, I, I think we have automated the complete process of DevSecOps where we put uh, the Dast and SAST tool in between the systems and the whole workflow on the life cycle uh, moves through security before it moves to the productive environment. I think that's something which we have done it. And over last one year, I think we have also put a lot of effort in uh, creating training and awareness for our development teams, uh, be it our internal teams or an outsourced development partners. For everybody, we have uh, clearly given the training uh, to understand how DevSecOps works and uh, the guidelines has been shared with them. And we also take compliance checklist uh, from the application uh, project managers uh, whenever there is a, a, a production movement which happens. So it's a continuous process and the DAST and SAST is incorporated as a part of the process which automates and ensures that uh, the relevant security uh, controls are considered at the right time without any delay uh, in the process. So as you've injected some of these, um, you know, checkpoints in the process for doing the, you know, the, the code scanning and the like, have you um, have you run into any pushback from the developers, uh, any friction between the security team and the development team, or has that been pretty smooth as you've kind of, um, you know, added some of these uh, these checkpoints to the process? Fortunately, we didn't have much of challenges because I think uh, in in on prem. Uh, agile methodology also uh, we have something called application security life cycle process the process actually uh, have an uh, intervention at every stage of sdlc uh, which gets into a secure sdlc so we get involved even in on premises the process is followed and which is little time consuming i would say while you consider the devsecops on the cloud so obviously i think the developer team and application team was very happy to actually consider this and actually onboard because it's going to 
uh, make the system very fast and uh, the processes can be easily adopted because it's uh, almost semi-automated. And the control to do this is with application team. They don't need to come back to security team. They don't need to come to application security uh, tester to do an uh, VAPT exercise as it happens in the normal traditional way. So obviously I think application team was very happy enough. I think initial hiccups was there, but I think uh, we were working hands on hands and uh, together I think we have made this as a success story. I think right now, I think it has gone very seamless and I don't think application team has any issues or concerns of adopting a DevSecOps in the cloud. Gotcha, okay, so 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 basically what you said there is, you know, you've done your best to to kind of automate and, and seamlessly in, inject this into their normal everyday, you know, kind of work. And that's been what's sort of key to, to not hearing the pushback. I mean, they can they can make some of these decisions and solve these issues with the coming, without coming back to your team. And sure. that's been helpful. Yeah. Sure. Okay, excellent. I think that's that's great perspective. Um, so Doug, we had um, a question that has come in from the audience and I think it's it's actually, you know, perhaps good to address, um, you know, right now, because I think it's, it's, it's somewhat on, um, on topic with what we're talking about here. So the question is, how could cloud network and security teams collaborate better to mitigate risk and help their organizations embrace change faster? Yeah, uh, I mean, it's good. And, and I think it's, it, it echoes some of the comments that, uh, that, that John and, and Mikesh were, were, were making earlier. The, 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 the best and easiest is to have a clearly defined framework and requirements that, that everybody understands what success looks like. From, from a security perspective as well as as well as everything else and um, and and make it make it easy to comply and and your, your earlier question around friction was 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 interesting um, we've actually used friction to, to our advantage so we have standard secure patterns that 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 um, that are pre-approved and if the teams are developing according to those to those patterns then it's really easy we don't have to get involved it's you know and it's nice and frictionless. If, if they believe that they are special in some way, then um, the, the friction levels go up you know, exponentially depending on, on, on how difficult they're trying to make it for themselves. And that in itself ensures you know, adherence to, to, those, to those patterns and standards. So, so that's, that's the, the, the kind of the way we, we, we collaborate and, and it's, it's, it's taking people on, on that journey as well. But the, the key, as I said, to start off with is, is to make sure that everybody is clear around the requirements and, and what success looks like and, and kind of why we're doing what we're doing. And then that, that makes everything else um, far easier. Okay, great. So it's, it's pretty clearly communicated to them up front. You know, these are the, 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 the lanes within yes. which we're gonna leave you alone. <laughs> and if you get outside of it, then you have to deal with the, you know, deal with the inquisition, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, and I, I hear the same thing from, from a lot of organizations, you know, let's, let's do our best. And I've now heard it from both of you guys, uh, Choice in a Row, Doug and Makesh, both similar kind of, kind of statements where, um, you know, you allow these teams to operate within a certain kind of, uh, you know, kind of bounds and, and, you know, they make decisions on their own and uh, it's only when they veer out of those bounds. I mean, I think that, um, you know, leads to continued innovation on the, on the developer, the application team side, but then also perhaps, you know, uh, frees your teams up to, to focus on, you know, other areas where, um, you know, perhaps they can't, you know, they can't uh, remove themselves from the, from the situation. So it's, it leads to greater efficiency all around, which I think is fantastic. Um, Okay, I want to, you know, maybe change gears just a little bit here and talk about something that's a hot topic for pretty much every, you know, CISO on the planet and has been for a few years now, and that's been, that's been ransomware, right? So this continues to be a, a plague, you know, it seems like every couple of months there's some massive ransomware outbreak of some sort. Uh, and as an industry, uh, we seem to have not been able to, uh, to really resolve this, this situation, but um, you know, I think in, in a lot of ways, moving to the cloud represents, can at least can represent a fresh start for security, right? This is brand new architecture, brand new set of, uh, you know, set of, set of applications. Uh, and it's not very often that we get one of these fresh starts in, uh, in technology and, and in security more specifically. Um, 
so, and I know obviously it's more complicated than that. It's not a brand new fresh start for everything, but uh, in many ways that, that can be an opportunity, right? So, you know, what are some of the things that you think that security leaders, especially those that are just starting on this cloud journey uh, can, can do differently to help thwart this ransomware uh, threat that has continued to be such a huge problem for so many organizations? You know, John, I, see, I think I saw you kind of shaking your head a bit there as I, uh, as I asked that question. So maybe I'll, I'll start with you here. How do we get rid yes. of this uh, when we move to the cloud or can we? Uh, well, well, I think we all wish that we, we can get rid of it, but um, certainly cloud has advantages in the, the ability that you, um, uh, to implement you know, security controls. So uh, uh, when my organization was formed uh, and I joined back in, in 2016, um, it was the uh, the quickest approach to actually get um, yeah, internet filtering at, at scale or, or um, uh, email filtering at, at scale. Um, but then it also has the, the risks. So with the move to Office 365, it's so easy to uh, compromise you know, someone's, someone's account. So um, we've really taken a, a kind of trust no one approach. Um, so we're scanning content inbound, outbound, internally so that we can um, uh, actually have some confidence of, of the content as it moves you know, around our network. Um, and then also training users uh, to spot the risks. They're the last line of, of defense and actually training them in an entertaining and informing way so that they're, um, so it's relevant to securing their, their digital life and, and not just the, the corporation um, and really extending uh, my meager cybersecurity team with uh, with the wider work workforce really, and, and using them to actually yeah, spot the risks. Probably one of the um, the other big uh, improvements that we made is is really twenty four seven endpoint detection and response. So that's our last line of defence. So if something does get through, we've uh, we've got that. Um, and then removal of admin rights when we rolled out Windows ten. Um, that had quite a, uh, a significant uh, improvement on just the detections we were we were seeing. So really filtering the content, removal of, of uh, admin rights and, and training the users are, are probably the uh, really the, the three sort of uh, the key things. Um, and with the training, we've, we've got probably a, a reliable cross section of the organization that we can trust to actually uh, you know, report uh, you know, suspicious uh, uh, instance or, or phishing emails, um, and then we've built quite a quite a robust uh, process for um, uh, uh, the mechanism for them to actually report those, and then to actually alert us if uh, if we believe it's a, it's an active uh, threat or not, so that we can then actually step in and uh, uh, take the, the relevant activity. But um, yeah, certainly removal of admin rights was a was a big in, improvement with uh, with well, Windows 10 rolling. I'm sure it is sometimes the uh, simplest sounding things can have the biggest yeah. uh, the biggest impact, though I'm sure that removal admin rights was not without its its uh, fair share of revolt from uh, from some vocal users. Uh, absolutely. Um, it is it is difficult to to remove uh, people's privilege because they um, uh, they feel like that you know, people aren't untrusted, but um, when you uh, actually you know pull that back to to a for a valid risk and also uh, the obligations that our clients uh, expect of us. Um, you know, the business actually then starts to understand, you know, what, why we're doing it. It's not just uh, uh, security just being the, the killjoys, but we're actually doing it to, uh, you know, to serve our, our, our clients. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. It sounds like you're covering a lot of the, a lot of the bases there. Uh, Doug, anything, anything differently than you're, that you're doing here? Um, yeah, so I, I, I just wanted to add to, to John's comment and the pushback that the, the users come back with in terms of don't, don't you trust me? And my response always to that is, is it's not that I don't trust you. It's the people that are pretending to be you that I don't trust. You, you know <laughs> what I mean? it, it's, it's, it's that social engineering and the, that impersonation and stuff like that 
that, that we have to protect against. And it's very hard for us to tell the difference between the real user and and the the you know the bad guy pretending to be you, you know the the real user and and that that resonates and that helps you know and and um, the whole social engineering aspect behind a lot of these attacks is is crucial and the only way really to address that is to is to remove the the the, the privileges that the, the users have so that they can't be used against you um, but uh, the 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 in terms of that cloud adoption um, question. Uh, because there was a degree of nervousness around the cloud from, from its inception around security, we've, we've used that to our advantage and, and made sure that security was really baked in. So as, as part of that migration to the cloud, the, the, the recognition that we needed to, to, to get serious about security, that you know, the perimeter is evaporated, um, we, we, re, we really used that and leveraged that to ensure that we got all the security capability that, that, that we needed from the outset and it wasn't an afterthought and, and you know to try and retrofit security is is, is, is difficult or impossible and, and and so that's the key is, is to be clear around what security controls you need and make sure that they are built in from the outset. Gotcha excellent. Well as I so as I look at the uh, the time here, as always uh, in these panel discussions, time has, has flown by and I wanna make sure that we have plenty of time here for Moinul to, uh, to deconstruct this real world data breach. So maybe I'll ask the three of you, starting with you, Makesh, you know, any, any final thoughts, words of wisdom or advice for attendees that are you know, perhaps just starting their cloud journey and, and worried about security? I think I, I would like to start with uh, uh, one um, uh, learning which we got it as like, I think cloud is going to be inevitable. I don't think uh, we as a CISO, as a community uh, have any choice to say yes or no for a cloud journey. I think that has gone uh, way long right now. Uh, 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 two things I want to just put it forward for people to consider. One is like, yes, of course, I think you need to have a proper uh, framework for cloud journey. Uh, which incorporates uh, a processes, which incorporates uh, the security technologies, and uh, the framework should consider all the aspects, including the uh, people, which is a fundamental for information security. In that, I think the technology should be available for you to have uh, in, uh, a complete visibility and continuous monitoring on the cloud assets. That's one of the challenges which I see right now for most of the companies uh, who is onboarding on the cloud journey. Second is uh, about uh, the people aspect where the upskilling and uh, maintaining the clear roles and responsibilities and ensure people do their job. I think the continuous monitoring along with this uh, will help you actually to uh, succeed in the cloud journey without any major sec uh, security incidences. Excellent, thank you. John, any um, parting thoughts to, to kind of add here? Top of what yeah, you so I'd certainly back up the, the visibility of uh, what's happening in your, in your cloud environments. Uh, but also do your due diligence. So have that framework of uh, um, you know, your expectation of a cloud service. Can you can you offshore? Uh, does it need to be onshore? Um, and then really uh, yeah, understand your requirements and then do the due diligence of any cloud solution uh, uh, before you go too far with it, really. Excellent. And then maybe we'll end where we started with, with you, Doug. Yeah, the, my main takeaway, I um, is security has got the, the attention now that, that it didn't have historically because of all the breaches and, and, and things that are happening. It's, it's a hot topic at board level. They recognize the, their roles and responsibilities. So it's, it's our opportunity as, as the heads of security to, to shine and to provide that support and advice and, and, and inform those decisions that are being made. And so, so it's, it's our opportunity to, to, to step forward and, and provide that expertise um, and, and, and really make the most of, of this, this opportunity because um, that the, the, the window could close. Um, and uh, so, so for everybody, you know, really drive the conversation and, and make sure that, that, uh, that the organization takes the appropriate, uh, pays the appropriate attention to this. I love that. You know, CISO has been asking for years to get the attention of the executive team and the board of directors, and now they have it. So I guess your advice is don't squander the opportunity. Um, fantastic. That's a, that's a great note to end on here. 